Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, one of the first things I do when I start preparing a weather briefing is just look at current temperatures. And this morning at 2.20 when we got things going, take a look at how hot it was still in the desert southwest. By midday today, this is what the mid-level of the atmosphere is going to look like in terms of its flow. And the ridge that we saw firmly become entrenched over the weekend is going to be a major feature throughout at least the next seven plus days. Around this ridge, we have some interesting weather. We're going to have several thunderstorm complexes like we saw over the weekend kind of running its periphery, including more thunderstorms that could race through the south central part of the United States, where yesterday's thunderstorm complex has produced a lot of severe wind damage and some large hail. The severe weather on the northwest side of this ridge today in parts of Oregon moving into the Pacific Northwest fed on a lot of moisture, which over the weekend brought storms into California. On the downstream side, the broader trough going to keep things relatively cool over parts of the eastern United States. But upstream, we do have a couple of troughs in the upper levels I'm going to watch carefully. In the near term, they're going to have to run over this ridge. But the longer term question I have is, do we go back over to a pattern like we saw in the month of July where troughs kept cascading out of, well, parts of Alaska, parts of the Pacific Northwest, and then racing across the Canadian prairies, giving us regular cold fronts that moved through the midsection of the United States. All of those questions are ones I'm going to be trying to answer this week. But before we get any farther, I at least have to show you how hot it got under that ridge yesterday. So first thing we're going to do is I'm going to take you to Furnace Creek. This is in Death Valley in California, where the weather station nearby picked up temperatures yesterday that got to 128 degrees Fahrenheit. And with uh, those temperatures, take a look at what we got here at Furnace Creek Visitor Center. They recorded a maximum of 130. We're going to have to go through and verify this probably today or early this week to see if that temperature was achieved. But I'll tell you this, with 7% humidity and a northwest wind at 2 miles an hour, there was not much relief in terms of the uh, incredible heat that was here in the desert. And I think we can see it on this guy's face. This was one of the pictures that went viral yesterday of the Furnace Creek um, thermometer here hitting 130 degrees Fahrenheit. I just love the look on that guy's face, clearly expressing what it's like to be in that kind of heat. But take a look at the moisture surrounding that ridge. We were bringing in relatively high precipitable water content into California, into the Northwest. This is going to fuel those storms later today. You can also see coming around the other side of it, the higher humidity air that was pulling through the Central Plains, also fueling the storms there. Now, speaking of the storms in California, we had a rare lightning show in parts of the San Francisco Bay Area. And across uh, the Central Plains of the United States, getting up toward the Great Lakes states, thunderstorm complexes rolled through over the weekend, again, including some very nasty storms yesterday here. But over the southeast, getting up into the mid-Atlantic, this is an area that over the next few days I'm going to be watching for a lot of thunderstorm activity. Now, on uh, the weekend, or over the weekend, excuse me, one of the large fires that is just outside of like Reno, Nevada, but it's in California here, produced some very deep pyrocumulus clouds, which kind of took on the ambient wind shear profile of the atmosphere, which meant they began to rotate. And as you can see over there in the video on the left, it produced these large rotating columns. You know, this is a, a tornadic circulation here beneath one of these pyrocumulus clouds. I don't know who to give credit, uh, the, the credit for the video because it was so widely shared, I couldn't find the original source, but over there on the right, the National Weather Service out of Reno uh, retweeted an incredible picture here showing you what one of these circulations look like. From there, I would like to show you a salad animation yesterday. This is uh, midday going into the evening hours, and I'm rocking back and forth on this because I want to see the overall flow around that ridge. Look at the large thunderstorm complexes that erupted in the central plains. Look at the multiple frontal boundaries that move through parts of the eastern corn belt here. And you can also see the storms firing up along the coast. This is something we're going to continue to see here in the southeastern part of the United States. But if I could draw your attention right back here to the state of Colorado, we are watching several large fires in that area and our high resolution rapid refresh model is picking up on the next 48 hours of where that smoke is going to go. It is largely going to stay trapped within that upper level ridge. Can you see it just circulating around there? So major air quality issues here for the western United States as we look at vertically integrated smoke through the next two days. Now from there, I'm going to talk about some bigger picture things I'm watching. In last week's videos, we discussed quite a bit how the MJO, which after spending, well, the end of May all the way through the end of July in phase one and two, came out through phase three, four, over into phase five, six, and is now currently sitting right here. You see, the models are predicting the MJO to go back into phase one and two. And this is what that's going to mean. When you look over here at the right, 
on the image on the right, excuse me, these colors represent trade winds that are stronger than normal, which means they're going in this direction. So basically from Indonesia toward Africa. We then have these warmer colors here over this part of the Pacific, which would indicate westerly winds. In the middle, right here, phase five, six, and seven, we're going to have air diverging out of that area. Now, why that's important is because of our La Nina. Now, we've been watching the strength of this La Nina for a while, but phase five, six, and seven are right in through here, where the air is going to be diverging near the surface out of that area. That means a lot of sunshine is going to be hitting this particular part of the Pacific, and that's going to prevent the ocean temperatures there from continuing to drop below this critical threshold of minus 0.5 degrees Celsius. You see they came down here, but they're starting to bounce back up. And if we beat on this area with a lot of sunshine because we've cleared things out, well, that's going to really limit the ability for the Salinina to strengthen in the near term. Plus, with the westerly wind bursts that are here on the eastern side of this, that's not indicative of a typical La Nina. So why I'm bringing this all up is because this may return us to a pattern that we saw throughout the month of July. For example, MJO in phase 1-2, well, that's what killed all the momentum here in the tropics of the atmosphere. We're going to see the atmospheric angular momentum, which has been recovering for quite some time now, possibly drop back off again. And if we take this part of the Pacific Ocean and really put a lot of suppression over, in other words, sinking motion in the atmosphere, that allows the air to rise here and here, and that extends across the main development region for hurricanes. Now, why I'm concerned about that is we are right now working our way toward the peak in hurricane season. It's that time of year. And therefore, we have this near-term meteorological event, which is timed with the long-term climatological event, which basically says the tropics around the United States, the Caribbean, they're going to get going here. We can already see that in the eastern Pacific, Fausto, Genevieve going, and then coming over to the Atlantic, we've got several areas that the National Hurricane Center is giving a 50 to 60% chance of developing over the coming days. Now, when I start to see this activity coming off of Africa, we begin to ask ourselves, what's wind shear doing? What's humidity doing? What about the dust? Well, to talk about the, the, the humidity side of this first, we can see that throughout this week, there are no large sections across the main development region, which again is in through here, where you have these bluer colors. That would represent where we have big plumes of dry air. We even look here at our dust uh, extinction coefficient, and we still see that while there's some dusty air in the Saharan air layer, it is not as dry and dusty as it had been. The next piece of this is going to be pressure. As we look out toward the end of this week, I noticed that the high pressure cell that had been sitting much farther to the east is starting to shift to the west. And why we concern ourselves is that in general, the flow around these high pressure cells looks something like that, which means should anything develop off of Africa, and yes, Africa's got a lot of tropical thunderstorm activity going on right now, it's going to run around the periphery of that ridge that's sitting there in the central Atlantic. And my concern is basically over this. Over the next 10 days, looking here at the European uh, model predictions of tropical low pressure systems, we can clearly see the dominance of that ridge influencing the flow here. So we're going to have to start keeping a very close eye on our east coast and gulf coast uh, as we work our way through the, the end of the month of August as things are starting to really take shape here in the tropics to get quite active. Coming back to the central United States, I just want to show you a, a press release here that went out uh, talking about fr from the Iowa Department of Agriculture. Some of the new data suggests that up to 14 million acres may have been uh, damaged. There are at least 14 million acres of insured crops within that damaged area. Some of the numbers may be as high as 6 to 7 million uh, acres that were completely destroyed. And the governor of Iowa put in a request for a national declaration of emergency uh, and also for $4 billion an aid to clean up after uh, the derecho event, which was one week ago today. And I'll tell you something, we're going to keep a close eye on this satellite imagery in through this area. And I'm specifically going to be looking at the NDVI data to see if we can tell how much of this crop was actually completely killed uh, by the derecho event. Uh, some of the pictures and videos I saw over the weekend were just devastating. Now, the thunderstorm complexes over the weekend stayed west of Iowa, and we can see all of the hail and wind reports in the Central Plains complex here, the one that came down into the Red River Valley, and also over here in parts of, of Mississippi, some stronger thunderstorms. And the total accumulated precipitation from this over the weekend, well, remember that ridge is kind of parked right in through this area. There were some rather large thunderstorm complexes that we saw running all along its ridge, uh, excuse me, the periphery of the ridge, including some big storms in parts of Arizona, one of which produced a 
large dust storm, a big haboob. When you look here, though, across the central plains, some of the storms that went through produced some very heavy rainfall. And of course, at the end of last week, our thunderstorm complexes that went through parts of South Dakota and Minnesota. Probably one area that I overestimated rainfall on was pretty far uh, to the eastern side of South Dakota. I thought the storms would at least start off there. But this will be an area that we're going to watch all week long for a lot more rainfall here, and I'll show you why in just a few moments. Today, tomorrow, and in the day on Wednesday, I got across the top there from the uh, Storm Prediction Center. Our biggest risk today is going to be in this part of the Pacific Northwest. But notice throughout the week, it's going to ride around that ridge right through the high plains coming out of the Rocky Mountains. And if you do also notice at the map on the bottom here, we have red flag warnings, excessive heat watches, excessive heat warnings, and high heat advisories all across the West as that ridge becomes firmly established. Now, in terms of the future radar here, this is just from the uh, NAM, the high resolution NAM model. This takes us out to Wednesday morning. What we notice here as I played this again is a lot of scattered storms in parts of the Eastern Corn Belt, scattered storms in parts of the Southeast, storms that run around the periphery of the ridge coming into the Central Plains, as you see here. And also notice what's going through parts of Oregon, Idaho, and into Montana. Just a lot of scattered storms across the United States with this ridge that's over the Southwest. We're going to take a look at the precipitation from three perspectives here. First, from NOAA and the National Weather Service. Again, there are those scatter storms we just talked about. The frontal boundary, the weak frontal boundary that's parked over the southeast, heavy, heavy rainfall here. And while parts of the Corn Belt could get some scattered storms in the coming days here, as we stretch this back up in the Canadian prairies, things do look drier here in parts of southern Alberta and Saskatchewan. But as the flow comes over that ridge and races here, through parts of Ontario into Quebec, we do notice better chances of some precipitation, at least better chances of at least getting a half inch out of this. Now, does the uh, European model agree with it? Overall, it does. You can see the drier conditions here. We can see it running around the periphery, scattered storms throughout much of the Corn Belt, but widely scattered, the heavy rain over the southeast, but again, we're going to see the pattern running around that ridge. The GFS has a similar setup to it, although the GFS is a bit more aggressive with these thunderstorms that are in parts uh, of the eastern Dakotas into Minnesota. We're going to talk about just in a few moments here. So from that point forward, I just want to play for you the operational European model. And as it runs out here, you can see the overall setup, including the operational European putting in a tropical system in the Gulf by day 10. Now, we're going to call this, of course, into question. It's just one model run, but it shows you how active things are starting to get. I'd like to take you back and show you the next few days, though. So starting off today, this afternoon, this evening, we can watch for some scattered storms, potentially right here along a weak frontal boundary, and also here along the mid-Atlantic into the southeast. Going into uh, later on today, we're going to go into the overnight hours and into early Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon and evening. And once again, we could watch for some scattered showers in through parts of Kentucky into uh, up here against the Appalachian Mountains and again in the southeast. Remember, you saw it. Why these scattered storms still coming around that ridge into this area? Going from there into Wednesday morning, afternoon and evening, we see again as high pressure builds over the Great Lakes, we see widely scattered storms on the southern periphery of it right into the southeast. And this is where we start to bring in more organized showers into parts uh, here getting over into Ontario. From there, let's play this forward and take a look out at Thursday morning, afternoon and evening. Now let's get ourselves into Friday morning afternoon and evening. You can see the dominance of the ridge keeping large organized low pressure systems out of play, but still scattered storms around its periphery, and almost a continual chance of storms each day in the southeast. But it will be on Friday night that I'm going to watch the northern plains getting into the Great Lakes states carefully right in through here. Both the GFS and the European are picking up on those thunderstorm chances. But as I play this forward through the weekend, this is Saturday evening, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon and evening. We just see overall a lack of clarity in the pattern because of the establishment of that big ridge over the west, not letting any organized systems really roll through the central part of the United States toward the east. From here, I want to take you up to the upper levels and show you the pattern. Here it is. This is this morning. And we can see a highly amplified pattern here. Let me try that again. Looking something like this. Now, as we go forward in this pattern, this is one week from now. And this ridge is still firmly in place here. But I have some questions about what's happening upstream there 
and also downstream coming across Europe. Because by day 10, notice that the models are now trying to bring a trough into the Pacific Northwest, flatten out the ridge here, but still keep a trough pretty firmly established in the eastern part of North America. And by day 15, it wants to take us back into a pattern I saw in the North Pacific a lot during the month of July. I got some questions about this though. And my questions really center on, well, if the MJO stays in phase one and two, well, this helps. If the atmospheric angular momentum collapses, then that helps. But I'm not so sure the pattern's gonna get here as fast as we think. The GFS keeps things much more amplified. And there's a big difference in the downstream flow, and it's right here. So if you hear meteorologists talking about, hey, we're returning back to what we saw in July. For that to happen, we've got to see a dominant ridge sitting over the Arctic and a dominant trough here over Northern Europe. If that happens, then I will believe the pattern setting up in the North Pacific a lot more, which brings in regular systems through the Canadian prairies. While it builds in some heat at times into the Corn Belt, a cold front comes through and cools things off. It's a very regular and moving pattern. So this will be what we're watching because that's what we saw during the month of July. From there, let's just take a look at the week two precipitation patterns. GFS is on the left, European is over there on the right. With the GFS having the more amplified pattern, I see more storms coming out of the Canadian prairies, more storms in the Great Lakes states. The European flatter just keeps things relatively drier. I don't think we have much confidence at all in the week two forecast at this point though, because the ensemble spread is so large. So we'll be watching out, please be watching out for my long range forecast at my.nutrientactsolutions.com because not only am I going to be talking about this potential MJO stalling event, but I'm also going to bring up some new information about what we're thinking about for harvest because we know it's 17, 18, and 19 had some very wet spots. Okay, National Digital Forecast Database Temperatures. This is the high temperatures today, another scorcher west as you can see here. But as we play this forward, what we're going to notice is throughout the day on Tuesday, getting into Wednesday and Thursday, with that pattern firmly established, not much change. We do start to build back in some above average temperatures to the western Corn Belt and the northern plains, but still staying near average to cooler than average for a big section of the mid-south to the southeast where those thunderstorms will be. Friday, getting into Saturday and Sunday. What we do notice here is that much of the eastern half of the country avoids heat stress while the ridge stays parked out west. From there into the six to 10 day time period, both models do agree on that ridge hanging around out west. But the question becomes as we go from the six to 10 day to the 11 to 15 day, as the models really try to flatten things out, are we really gonna be bringing in that much warmth this far to the east? Or will we return over to a pattern that brings troughs into the northwest through the Canadian prairies, which will bring fronts that come through this section of the country with good regularity? That's what we saw during a lot of the month of July. So some big questions to answer there. As we finish this up, the way I want to talk about the international weather today is I would like to take you straight to the web. And we're going to go here and take a look at NDVI data, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. The color bar that you see here, well, when you get over to these colors representing good health health, uh, vegetation health from space, and the darker colors represent bad. What you have though on this set of images is a scroll bar, or a sliding bar. And what I'm going to do is show you 2019 first, and then we're going to see 2020. So when you look here, we can see in 2019 in parts of Europe, there were some places that were really struggling. As we move the sidebar over, we see much better crop improvement, at least as viewed from space, in 2020 than we saw in 2019. But what you'd like to see is what's north of the Black Sea, where Ukraine is sitting. So just take a quick look here. I'll kind of zoom in for us. We notice that in 2019, this is how things looked. But in 2020, do you see a lot more of those darker colors? Watch it again. 19, here's 2020. 19, 2020. I still see some changes here that would say that the crop does not look as good in 2020 that is as it did in 19 in parts of Ukraine. Let's zoom out and come over here to parts of China. Now if we look in the North China Plain, this area up here, this is 2019. As I slide over into 2020, it's difficult to see, but there are some improvements in certain places in 2020. It's been quite wet there. And through the Yangtze River, right in through here, this is 2020 back to 2019. So the flooding problems are actually showing up now much clearer. Look at this, right in through here, right in through there. 2020, 2019. So the flooding on the Yangtze River, we're expecting still more heavy rain over the next 15 days, is really showing up. But the last place I would like to take you is down here to Australia. This is 2019. Look at Western Australia. 
as I slide over and show you 2020, there are pockets of drought in 2020 that are really showing up here. But as you get farther to the south and west, things look pretty good. Now, coming over to this side, I would like to zoom in because if we just well, maybe zoom out a little bit, there we go. If you take a look again, 2019 to 2020, look at the improvement in parts of New South Wales and Victoria, 2019, 2020. So just want to show you that perspective as I wrap up this video. Thanks for your attention today. Have a good rest of your day and we'll talk to you again very soon. Thanks.